He has bravely driven the roads in the snowy east in North Carolina and come to see us because yesterday morning his publicist said she wasn't sure he was going to make it. I was not. Oh, is this on? You're on. <laughs> I was not sure either. Um, we were. Uh, it wasn't really as much of a storm as they wanted us to think it was, but it was bad enough. And the worst part for me is getting out of my driveway <laughs> because it's like this. And in the summer, people stop and say, uh, we're going to walk up to see you. Uh, I'm not going to try my car on that. But when it's got an inch of ice on it, it's, you know, it's an e-ticket, as we used to say. <laughs> It's a slalom. It is. Right, without a safety net. You can, you can have driveways like I'm from Chicago, so when I first came to Arizona, I used to look at driveways like that out here on the side. I used to think, seriously? <laughs> then I forgot <laughs> that it was going to look like that in December, just yeah. as much as it would in June. Right? Well, we laugh about it because where we are, they, uh, they close the public schools if there's you know half an inch of snow. And of course, the explanation, like everything else, well, okay, anything in business, the explanation is always marketing. But in, in public life, it's lawyers. And they're afraid if anyone slips and goes off the road, if there's a tiny bit of snow, that they'll sue the school system. So we get these calls at 6 a.m. Good morning, parents. This is Wayne, your principal. Um, school will be canceled today because of hazards on the road. And so we have <laughs> turned this into a series of stand-up routines. Good morning, parents. This is Wayne, your principal. I got up this morning and saw my shadow. No school this week. <laughs> it's like the ground hound, right? Bobby, yeah. You can play whack-a-mole. Well, you've just, you've just actually put in an argument for national health. I, I used to be a personal injury lawyer, so I can tell you that the reason all this happens is there's nobody to pay for the medicals if anybody is hurt. So I am not on the side of Elizabeth Warren, but nonetheless, we ought to have some sort of coverage for it. But let's progress. Let's talk about, <laughs> let's talk about the Iranian crown jewels. Now, isn't it funny how everything comes back to politics nowadays? <laughs> well, hopefully, we'll move past that yeah. at the end of next year. Um, a heist novel. Yes. What inspired you? I mean, Dexter was so off the charts. Um, did you decide you couldn't do anything conventional? Uh, I needed a new chart. Um, I had always told people that if I got tired of Dexter and I was just phoning it in, I'd stop writing it. And um, I wasn't there yet. I really wasn't. And I think the, the last book, Dexter is Dead, is um, it, it's one of the best. I, I agree. You were here to sign it. And we talked about it. And I agreed with you. I thought it was. But um, everyone <coughs> was saying you're getting tired. You're, you're probably tired of doing this now. I'm like, no. <laughs> uh, it's what I always wanted to do. I wanted to be, you know, John D. McDonald and have a series that lasted for you know, 14 or 15 books. And I was in the groove with it. Um, but when my wife said, you must be getting tired of it, I started to think about it because <laughs> Sorry, although I, I disagree with her on many occasions, <clears throat> she's always right. So, um, I realized, no, I'm not tired of it, but I might be soon, and I should probably go out on top and quit before I'm tired of it. Not that last book was really just phoning it in, I better stop now. Instead, it was like, that last book was great, I quit. Oh. <laughs> but you do mention that in your case, you couldn't really write without, or is it you that wrote in the back of this book that... Because people um, say, I couldn't have done yes. this without the support of my wife. It's and you true. said it's literally true in your case because she's an editor, right? A lot of male writers say, I could never have done this without my wonderful wife. And what they mean is, she brings me coffee. <laughs> and she does all the bullshit work while I just sit here and go, do, 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 do. But what I mean is, there's at least one point in every book I've ever written where I go, what do I do? And then I say those three magic words that always bail me out. Hillary, help me. <laughs> um, she is, she's a, you know, a published writer in her own right, among other amazing talents. And she is one of the best I've ever met on structure. 
And so she'll say, okay, you set this up to do there, you have to pull this in, use that, and go over here and put that in, and then write a scene where that happens. Before we have another comic turn, I'm just going to drink some water. <laughs> but <Gosh>. anyway. <laughs> oh, sorry, they gave me a chair, but I can't sit in. I don't know what, what happened oh, to my red chair. I thought it was just me. No, no, this one is unyielding, so I've now tried to fall off it twice. <laughs> My neck was giving out trying to look this way, so I thought I'll turn the chair, but that turned out to be the same. So, oh well. I just taught a, a university class, yeah. and the chair's in the seminar room. The first day I get in and sit down, all right, and I lean back and I'm about to say something, and the whole back of the chair just keeps going back and back. What the? So I spent the whole semester you know, sitting like this and forgetting and going, what? <laughs> Okay. okay. Well, if you keep an eye on the audience, at about 55 minutes, they start really squirming. <laughs> and when the clock comes up to 8 o'clock, we quit because it's just too hard to sit in these chairs I'll be anymore. gone on 54 or something. <laughs> <laughs> see how it goes. Um, back on track. Yes, um, right. You decided then to start a new series and write about a heist. But what I thought was interesting, I mean, Dexter... Dexter was a serial killer, but he was a serial killer with sort of a moral purpose. He was taking out basically. Yes, but it wasn't his moral purpose. He no. was killing people because he liked to kill people. Right. And so you have a new character who's a thief, but he too appears to be perfectly willing to kill people. Yes. So why is it that that sort of character attracts you? Um, I, I don't know if it's, if it's fair to be honest. Why not? Uh, okay. It, it doesn't really. It attracts publishers. Ah. And oh, PK, thank you very much. Let's drink. <laughs> Excellent. I can watch me struggle to get into this one. I have to hook my arm around it. <sighs> there. Yay, made it. It's, um, I did 12 years of hard time in Hollywood. And one of the things I learned about was that the cliches about typecasting are true. And it's the same with writing nowadays, apparently, or at least in my case, because I look at other writers who have been writing Nazi treasure books for 20 years and suddenly write historical fiction or fantasy, and it's fine. Um, but for whatever reason, I'm not permitted to do that. And I know this because in the four years between this book and the last Dexter book, among the other things that I wrote was uh, the first... 3,000 pages of a fantasy series, and nobody even wanted to look at it. <laughs> well, I it just I just thought it was interesting because when we start out, you know, it's not it's not a spoiler, but um, I wasn't sure what kind of a guy he would turn out to be. So basically, he's a thief, right? Yes. Who also kills people, but um, and he he seems to need a constant challenge and to up his game. So yes. he starts out, you know, here, but then going after the great diamond um, is like the ultimate challenge for a thief. So I did, I did wonder at the end of the book whether he succeeded or not. I won't say. Um, what kind of a challenge is left for him if this one was the big challenge? Well, sadly, uh, I've come up with something, and I'm about halfway through the next book. Why sadly? Oh, because. This time it really is much harder. Now, hopefully when you read the five or six copies each that you buy of this book, <laughs> you'll think, wow, um, what could be harder than that? Because what he steals is the Iranian crown jewels that are guarded by uh, electronic technology that is, it's not even state of the art. It's years beyond state of the art. It's what they call Star Trek stuff. Um, plus, a team of um, retired SEALs. Um, it, it's basically, it's, it's like, um, it's based on Blackwater, that kind of, of operation, and a full platoon of Iranian Revolutionary Guards. And they're all surrounding it night and day, heavily armed, and all of it, and Riley Wolf finds a way to steal it. And I thought, how would I top that with the next one? <laughs> And whether I topped it or not, I came up with something harder. And I don't want to tease it too much because um, 
No, you don't. You'll really have to buy several copies of this book <laughs> to get interested in the next one. So did you watch the movie Topkapi um, two years ago? Yeah, um, uh, like a million years ago. How many of you ago? saw Topkapi? Right, it was Peter Usanov, right? Yes. This was, um, and I've been I've been to Topkapi now two or three times, uh, a, a great jewel heist, and in order to penetrate the security in Istanbul in the famous palace, uh, it was really fun. I mean, today, thanks to computer graphics and all the rest of it, it would probably look really old school, you know, to try to watch the movie, but when it was made, it was really exciting. Yes, it was, and it also introduced me to Peter Ustinov. Who was glorious, wasn't he? Wonderful, and I, I saw as many of his movies after that as I could. Me too, but I thought Topkapi was really kind of like the crown jewel of, of heist, as, it as, far as, as far as films go. But I really don't remember much about it. I remember it was a heist movie, and I remember Peter Ustinov. They were swinging from the dome at one point. You could hardly escape that if you were in the palace itself. Uh, okay, there, there's spoiler alert. There's no dome swinging. <laughs> <laughs> I said that would be old school. But I actually thought of you. Did, all, did you read about the in Dresden in the famous Green Vault, um, yes. which I have also been to see twice? Um, I tried to think of a way to connect it for publicity, but I'm not good at yeah. that. But talk about old school. I mean, you know, if they had just, the thieves broke in through a window and then hammered the glass around the famous jewels and walk out with them. And I thought, this is really low level security, especially for Germans who are so what, high tech. For what they got away with, which is in the B billions of dollars right. uh, in value. And I thought, well, your guy could have just, I mean. Too easy. Yeah. <laughs> There's a thing about this character, Riley Wolf. Um, he needs a challenge. The whole reason he does what he does is because he grew up with, you're nothing, you can't do it. Um, he was what we call back home trailer trash. <laughs> and he grew up with the rich kids bullying him and saying, you're, you, can't, you can't do it. And so finally he reached a turning point where he said, all right, I can do it and I'll show you. And what that did was give him the need to prove himself and do increasingly difficult things. And at the same time, there's a special treat if he's doing it to the 1%. Um, there's nothing sweeter than stealing something ridiculous for somebody who didn't earn it, who was just born into having that kind of stuff. And that's what he's all about. Uh, he has to do it if it can't be done. So along the way, has he acquired a risk addiction? He must have. I think so. Uh, I worked um, with Dexter too, but on, on developing the character of Riley Wolf, I worked with a psychologist, and um, she steered me through you know some of the things that I was wondering about, and made suggestions along the way, and uh, I think it worked out pretty good. Except there was one flashback sequence that the editor didn't like, so that was taken. I thought about you. Did you read about the, the climber who had like done everything supposed to be the greatest climber in the world today and just fell to his death? Um, and the reason he fell to his death is that he had not bothered to knot the rope that he was coming down and he had a partner and he was so overcome or careless or whatever that he died stupidly. I mean, he did all these great climbs and then in Mexico, he falls off a rope that he failed to knot and that was the end of him. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, if people, there was a, a young woman too, who her risk was to have helicopters drop her off at the top of mountains and she would, you know, zoom down through the glaciers and the avalanches. So unsurprisingly, an avalanche caught her and killed her. And I wonder, you know, if risk addiction is so flirting with death that at some point people get careless and let it happen. I, I, do you see that I, as a potential for Riley? I do. Um, I mean, he's generally speaking meticulous in his planning, but there can come a time when it's something he considers like beneath him right. and, and too easy, and he'll take... The same thing happened to me when I was doing martial arts. Um, the time I got hurt the worst was when I was sparring with somebody young and inexperienced. You know, I was a black belt, and this was a yellow belt, which was, that's like the first level you're allowed to spar. And I was like, I wonder what's on TV later. Uh, I'm going to go home soon. Let's see what we're having. Go Ow! <laughs> and she broke my hand. <laughs> well, yes, so well, that's my happen. point. So yeah, I suppose exactly. if you get tired of Riley, you can just have him like, forget to knot the rope. And, <laughs> and um, well, 
I mean, but I do think that people who are addicted to risk, that, that sort of generally happens to them. They just keep pushing it, and then yes. and then they get careless, and there we are. So tell us about the, the rich family, because they're an interesting dynamic, the people that own this museum. Right. Well, um, they're based on sort of a amalgam of different robber baron families, um, American, you know, the Rockefellers and that sort of thing. Um, and... Um, old Ludwig Eberhardt was the founder of the dynasty, and um, his, I don't remember, I think it's his great-grandchildren are now running the trust and have inherited the billions, and there is an Eberhardt Museum in Manhattan. This was fun. Um, I had it designed by an imaginary protege of Sanford White's, um, and I made up a name that I thought sounded good for it. And the Eberhardt Museum looks like a combination fortress and um, treasury, which was exactly what <coughs> Ludwig Eberhardt had in mind. And because of that, and because it's a private museum, um, and they're not uh, susceptible to any government restraints on budget and so on, that's where they decide to display the Iranian crown jewels when they come to America. Uh, so it's at the Eberhardt Museum, and they turn it into an absolutely impenetrable fortress with this electronic stuff and the two teams of armed guards. And there's no way through it. Uh, you can't even possibly hope to circumvent the alarms. Only a couple of family members know the codes. So that's the problem that Riley Wolf is facing. How do I do that? Because it can't be done. So that requires you to figure out how to set it up and then how to go around it. Yes. How I, long did it take you? Oh, forever. <laughs> <laughs> this is, I think I told somebody um, in a pre-pub interview, this is not in my wheelhouse. Um, I, I'm a character guy. I love doing characters, and I developed stories that, you know, work from the character. This was literally sitting down and going, okay, part A has to fit into slot B, which pulls lever C. And, I, you know, it's like doing a Ruth Goldberg machine. And I've never been really good at that, and so it just took me forever to do this. I didn't think I could do it at all until, uh, again, my wife said, yeah, okay, that's it, you've got it. And I went, are you sure, really? <laughs> She's like, yeah, it's okay, so you'll be all right now. <laughs> so you're doing it again. I can see that you have the potential for risk addiction right here. <laughs> you're gonna figure out impossible no. crimes and I then get, I get them. pushed into it. I have a, a sit in my chair and be safe addiction. <laughs> It's actually a subgenre of crime fiction called Impossible Crimes, and there's an anthology of them the British Library has done. But especially in the golden age, there were people who really did sit around and try to dream up locker room mysteries or, you know, crimes that were, um, you just couldn't crack them. And of course, at some point, there always had to be a fatal flaw or, or it would never have gotten solved. And there probably are impossible crimes that have occurred that none of us know about because if we knew about them they wouldn't have been impossible yeah. right there's the the old one this is a, a, a even pre-internet this this has been a rumor that's been around for a while the mona lisa in the louvre is a fake and i i have been told uh, either that no it's not a fake but it has been stolen and returned several times and i've been told Yes, it was returned, but it was a fake that was returned, and the real one is forever. So a lot of things like that float around in the art world. Um, one of the things in the, the Riley Wolf projected series is his love for art. Um, and it's not based on the financial uh, aspect of the art either, uh, although that always enters into it in some ways. Um, it's just he, he really likes the stuff, some of it. Um, one of my favorite seeds. Uh, I grew up in, in art galleries and around art galleries. And um, so one of my favorite scenes is where he's doing a snarky comparison between um, um, Rauschenberg and uh, what's his name with the flag paintings? Uh, the guy's still alive. Jasper. Jasper. Sorry? Jasper Johns. Jasper. Yeah, yes. And he's doing a snarky comparison going, Rauschenberg just has so much texture, you just want to rub your face on it. And, you know, and Jasper Johns, well, people pay a lot of money for it. 
So it reminded me so much of some of the conversations I heard growing up about people talking about art in this incredibly passionate way. And regardless of how stupid what they're saying is, they're passionate about it, so it's fun. Riley Wolf is the same way. And he works with a beautiful woman who is maybe the greatest art forger uh, in the world. And she's kind of the same way. So there's a lot of room here to play with the paintings and sculptures. And I've even worked in something. This is something no one knows. No one's picked up on this yet. So you're in on the ground floor on this. One of my best friends has a little thing about uh, Sumerian votive figures, particularly Dudu the scribe. <laughs> so, Would you like to spell that for us? It's, it's okay. It's D U D U. It does not refer to caca. Um, and so I'm working that into every book from now on. Something about a Sumerian votive figure. So watch for that. <laughs> okay. A little hidden treasure in every book. Well, I mean, you know, art forgery is just is such a fertile field for crime yes. um, because. You can forge the provenance, you can forge the art. I mean, there are so many possibilities. If we ever find the Isabella Stewart Gardner paintings, I'm sure there will be a huge debate over whether they are fakes or whether they are the real things coming back. Um, I had a good friend who went basically broke and insane because he had a genuine um, Leonardo da Vinci painting. And he could prove everything. The paint chip said it's definitely from the studio of. And he had a provenance that led up to 1870 something and then stopped. But the place where it stopped, he could trace it from there to the place where he bought it. And so there was no question about it. And he had privately people say, there's no question it's the real deal. Publicly, no one would. So a painting that could be worth, what, a billion dollars? I don't know, an unknown Leonardo da Vinci or a known one that was lost, really because they do know about it. Um, and no one will publicly admit it, so it's not worth much. So I there were only 29 Da Vinci's. <coughs> Leonardo's. Sorry. Only 29 Leonardo paintings. Well, Wouldn't you think they would notice that this was one of the 29? What, they, what I know about it, because he tried to get me to write a book about it, was that um, a painting that is described uh, as being painted for, I don't know, one of the royals getting married. And it said, it's the infants, St. John and Christ embracing. And it, supposedly it showed two babies, you know, hugging with the Virgin in the background, looking flowery. And that's what this painting is. And uh, so they know that it existed, that he painted one like it, but it was supposed to be lost or destroyed. And apparently it uh, went from the royal who received it for a wedding present uh, to some uh, Brit who I think looted it during one of the Continental Wars and took it home and hung it up. And there's a whole story involving Savernella involved in it too, that he said he said the painting was heretical and had to be overpainted. Oh, my turn to correct you. It's oh, Savonarola. It's what? Savonarola. I thought you nobody would notice. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, We're trading points here. I'm an autodidact, <laughs> and uh, I learned to... I learned all these big Savannah words by Rola reading was a, a Florentine. He was a, a right winger, um, sort of a very very Catholic, and um, decided he would burn books in Florence. And I think was it the 16th or the 15th century? I thought it was 15th, but what, think when was Leonardo? Because he was also the 15th yeah, century, so 15th right? Century. Yeah. So a lot going on there. A lot of things lost, right? I was thinking about Van Meegeren, who I think is fascinating. It was a a Dutch forger, I think his name is Van Meegeren, I'm pretty sure, um, and his thing was Vermeer, who painted over and over again because he was so poor, um, the same room and like the same rug and the same, he only had like one or two models and um, a very, he's the one, the girl in the pearl earring, if you remember the Tracy Chevalier, that um, was a, I think it's the Vermeer. The, the, the blue is the thing with him too. There's something special about his blue. Right, and at one point in London, um, in one of the galleries, they had a, all the Vermeers that could be obtained. They hung them all up, and I was able to go and see that show. And 
it was just remarkable to see his use of light was fabulous. Anyway, for whatever reason, this Victoria, this Dutch forger decided Vermeer would be his his thing, and he was eventually caught. And I can't quite remember how, but the irony of it is that his forgeries are now worth almost as much <laughs> as the Vermeers, um, and it may be some confusion that exists now. What you know, which is the genuine Vermeer, which was the Van Meer and Vermeer. And I can't remember how he got exposed, but it was, again... And he might have signed his own name to one of them. <laughs> well, I've told this story before, but another risk-addicted. Um, some guy decided that he would make a killing in autographed collectible books, especially in the 90s when collectible books were a big investment and worth tons of money. And so he was coming up with these amazing signatures for books, you know, that nobody else had, and everybody was so impressed. How did he find them in state sales and all the rest of it? And then one day, he put up a signed copy of A Confederacy of Dunces, <laughs> and the whole thing went south, because the, it's a posthumous book. So the author died before it was published, therefore the author could never have signed it. Once he did that, it was like the guy falling off the rope because he didn't knock the rope. The whole thing unraveled, you know. And I wonder again, it's that whole thing about risk addiction. You know, you push it and push it and then maybe maybe you know, you either One get step too far. Yeah, you, know, you just get totally careless or maybe you just want to get caught so everybody can then say how clever you were. Because up until that moment Nobody thought he was being clever. Yeah, they thought he was just, you know, lucky that in, he found something. In a similar vein, uh, because of the family I married into, uh, my my wife's maiden name is Hemingway. Um, I came across a autographed first edition of a movable feast, which someone was in the process of writing a really big check for, and. I had a debate with myself. Um, do I tell him that Movable Feast was published posthumously? Um, you should. I, I should have, I know. <laughs> you conspired. I didn't conspire. I looked away. Is there a difference? <laughs> the, the, um, if it had been a conspiracy, I would have planned ahead of time to look away. And profited from it? Yes. yes. Well, anyway, I mean, this is a fascinating world. So you are clearly drawn to the unorthodox. What did you do before you wrote Darkly Dreaming Dexter, which I thought was oh, an boy. absolutely terrific book? And, Almost and many of you read Darkly Dreaming oh, Dexter? Yeah. I mean, it really was, you know, a fun thing to, to pick up. Well, um, I was doing four or five different jobs then. I was hosting a TV show and uh, coaching uh, girls' soccer. And I was writing a, I like to call it a semi-syndicated column. Um, it was called Fatherhood, and it was uh, in five newspapers, so semi-syndicated. Uh, and it was about, uh, my wife was um, doing, uh, producing the evening news for a TV station locally, and that left me raising two little girls by myself. So being a, basically a writer at heart, I started writing funny columns about that, um, things like taking my daughter to buy her first bra, um, which was torture for me, and she loved every second <laughs> of it. <laughs> so um, I was doing all of these different things and uh, trying to write this book that I didn't believe in. Um, and, um, you know, I don't have to do all of those anymore. I'm still available for like a coffee house gig if anybody uh, still does that kind of music around here. So. Well, no, I guess my question was, what drew you to the unorthodox? Because, I mean, you could have written virtually anything. I don't know. I mean, basically, I'm a weirdo. Um, <laughs> and I grew up um, reading some weird stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, the first really important author in my life was Edgar Rice Burroughs. And oh. I even read the Venus series. Did you really? I did. I'm impressed. Carson Napier. And... I think that's deeply ironic because I'd like to say now I have an Edgar Rice Burroughs complex. Um, if you go anywhere in the world and go, uh, people go, Tarzan, it doesn't matter what accent. Ah, he's Tarzan, yeah. Um, but then you go, Edgar Rice Burroughs, and they go, so I'm in the same boat. You go, Dexter, they got the ding, 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 ding. 
and you go, Jeff Lindsay, and they're like, same Edgar Rice Burroughs look, you know what? <laughs> so, um, but it, it, I think that stuff tends to warp you. I'm, maybe I started warped and that just helped, I don't know. But um, I, I've always felt like I was an outsider and that I had a different perspective because I'd say perfectly logical things and people would either gape at me or laugh at me. So <laughs> I know it seemed natural to end up all alone in a little room writing weird things. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not complaining. Uh, no, 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 no. I think it's interesting, you know, because basically before you are ever published, you know, you have a wide range of things that you could you could choose to write about. Jeff is right that today people tend to get branded. You know, once, um, I had this discussion with Janet Ivanovich when we launched her book, three or four weeks, and, you know, she said something about what people expect from an Ivanovich book is pretty clear. Yeah. Um, and, but when she wrote the first one, it wasn't pretty clear because, you know, it didn't even exist. So she could have written some other kind of book, but she chose that one. Well, I'd written several before. Um, there was Tropical Depression, which is, I guess you'd say, a, a thriller. Yeah. And there was a sci-fi book, and there were, actually, there was a couple of sci-fi books, but uh, they didn't really, you know, take off. Um, the uh, Tropical Depression was, um, uh, I can't remember his name now, that's very sad. It's obviously cognitive degeneration. Um, <laughs> The guy who this developed, is the guy you made up. No, this is the publisher <laughs> oh. who developed um, Andrew Wax and Cherokee John and that whole string. Stein, was it Stein? Was that his name? Anyway, he said you're going to be you're going to be my next big star. And I, he took Tropical Depression and said we're going to start slow. Don't worry if it doesn't sell big. And it didn't sell big, but I wasn't worried because everybody who read it liked it. And the publisher was going, yeah, yeah don't worry, you're going to be it. And I sent in the second book and didn't hear anything. And finally I called and they said, oh, um, no one told you. He died three months ago. <laughs> and I, all I could think, and I hate myself for this, but all I could think was, the bastard. <laughs> They're right by book. Yeah. yeah. My whole career. I have some dim memory. It's going to occur to me at some point who he was. You're right. But he was a very, um, very individualistic, yeah. yeah, but very, very famous guy. Yeah. <clears throat> so, how about questions from the audience? What do you do with a big gemstone like that if you have it and you stole it? Um, do you contact the insurance company? Oh. Um, again, with Riley Wolf, it's not really about the money. I mean, the money's great, and he's not going to turn it down. But um, the Darya e Nur, which is the crown jewel of the crown jewels, uh, is worth conservatively $15 billion. Just, it's the largest pink diamond in the world, which is why it looks sort of pinkish there. And Riley's habit would be instead of saying, all right, give me 15 billion for it, he'd say, just give me two billion, let's get it done quickly. Because, you know, money is money. It's great to have it. It's not great not to have it. But the difference between 15 billion and two billion is, you know, only important to the kind of people I won't invite to dinner. <laughs> um, so that's basically his, his thing, you know, do it with the insurance and get it done. You can sell it to a collector or somebody like that, and they'll drop a dime on you. Um, that's another Riley thing. Uh, never trust anybody. Um, one of the fun things, it's fun for me because it's already making me crazy. He has a series of things called Riley's Law, and they're numbered. So like Riley's Third Law, never argue with a truck. Um, Riley's First Law, the job comes first. And I'm now up to like 15, but I'm thinking, did I already use 15 and this is 16? <laughs> and I have to go back and look for, you know, the numbers again. But it's, it's, it's becoming like a, a light motif. Is it lead or light? Light. Thank you. Light motif in, in the books. Right well, the other thing I could mention um, is that if you didn't contact the insurance company, and if the jewel were so hot that probably nobody would buy it, then you would cut it down. And so there have been 
you know, some very sad cases of things like that stolen, where they... Which is like taking a great painting and turning it into coasters. Right. It's just like, yeah. no, if you is. know anything about it, it's like, oh! <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's the sad fate of some some objects of great value that are stolen. Get, is uh, in the uh, end, the only way to capitalize on them is to destroy them. Or you'll get a gorgeous them. brooch that's maybe a, a thousand years old in this amazing intricate setting, and it's so well known that it's, it, it, anyone would recognize it. And so they pick all the gems out and sell them individually and melt down the gold or silver mm -hmm. setting and sell that. And it's just like, uh, yeah. I mean, that's the not death penalty is not enough. Doing it, but, but the German jewels that were just stolen. They're, yeah, they're, they're worried stolen about that. Now. Yeah. I think because you a, can't sell. You can't this is sell why the insurance companies are so anxious to make the deal. Right. Yeah. 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 Now, I mean, I, sadly, it probably will be the fate of those. Was it um, the was it the Emperor Augustus? Was his Augustus the Strong? I think it was his jewels. Yeah, it was just one case. I remember they singled out one case, you know, amongst all of what was there. It's so. some great stuff in there. I mean, I've re very recently developed an interest in yeah. in this kind of thing. Yeah. Some of those were just gorgeous pieces. They were, but you know, it also leads you to believe that some of this was um, theft by. You know, by hire by a particular person. I mean, you have to hope that it was actually a collector or somebody who sent them in there to get it, and it will stay intact. Because if they targeted it specifically, then it's almost as though the crime were ordered. That's what they, they're not sure about the gardener, whether, you know, whether it was a mob thing for some kind of security to have the art for payment, or whether it was just. They broke in, and it was a random choice because they could have taken the Rembrandt or whatever it was. It's impossible to know, you know. And they think they may still be hidden somewhere in Boston, or they're hoping that you know one day they'll it's surface. Like the famous Boston painting theft too. It's the same thing. Was it 15 years ago? Someone broke into the small private Boston museum. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, right. Is, is talking only? about the German? No, I was that I segued. I'm sorry. sorry. The Isabella Stewart Garden, and even yeah. the Mona Lisa when it was stolen. Um, was found what rolled up by, or the, we have one right here, didn't we? The University of Arizona, the yeah. William de Cooney. Yeah. And they have yet and to figure. Just, didn't they just find it, or they when it, when right? the woman died, it was it was on the wall in the bedroom of this couple who had lived quietly in some small town in New Mexico, and when she died and somebody went into the bedroom, they thought it looked like, you know, something valuable, and eventually. Got to they the were right. of Arizona. But unfortunately, it also had some bad repairs, so apparently the restoration, well, well they cut well. it when they cut it out of the yeah. frame, too, so there was an interesting article about it. Yeah. Yeah. But you have to, this is an ordinary couple. Why did they steal a de Kooning out of this museum? I mean, was it a total crime of opportunity? They never sold it. They never can't, you know, what was going on? It's and not if you like a de Kooning very... enough to steal one, you think you treat it well enough, you know, not to slice it out of the frame or something. Plus, when you think of these high-tech robberies, and I, don't, I haven't read your book yet, there's there's, <laughs> there's a couple that for once. Where, where, where the excuse. criminals go in and they clandestinely steal the jewels or they steal the piece of art, and no one knows really until like the next day. They right. trip the alarms. That's they, the ideal. They're way meticulous. To do it. They're you know. But there's others like in Germany where they just are brutish. They go in and right. they smash stuff and they don't care and they're out, in and out of there. Yeah, yeah but the so. incredible thing about that was how low tech the whole right. setup. That's what I'm, and it's one of the most famous um, treasure vaults in the whole world. It makes you think seriously, they just broke a window yeah. and then they smash the glass in the case? It's crazy. There was a very famous case in France and I don't remember any names, but it was the same kind of thing. And the guy was, uh, all of his life, he'd been, you know, a burglar and looking for the odd ways in. And he realized that this one museum, they spent all this money on security, but the security on the windows was such that if you shatter the window, the alarms go off. But if you take out the screws around the base and the top and <laughs> lift the window out, nothing happens. <laughs> so that's what he did. <laughs> I mean, people spend, this is one of Riley's big things, too, I'm sorry, but people spend so much money on security and then think it's done, they're safe. I, I bought the best system there is. Nothing can happen now. Well, yeah, it can. 
because even like a standard uh, skylight, it'll be the same thing. You put the alarm so if you shatter it or if you try to pry it open, um, the alarm goes off. But if you sit down for two minutes, you'll think of ways to get around that and open it without shattering it or prying it. And nobody thinks about that. They throw money at it. And that's always going to get you in trouble if you've got something that somebody wants. Plus, you have to really trust the alarm, the alarm company because the most obvious people who will be able to get around the alarm are... Normally, they call you in the morning. Yep. Well, I, uh, last night, your alarm went off. So I hope nothing's missing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I'm going to just hang on a sec, please, sir. I'm going to wave goodbye to our video audience, and thank you very much for joining us this Bye, evening. Y'all.